the Good morning, good day, everybody. We see you still have some people logging in. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Thanks for tuning in. All right, looks like we're leveled off. So good morning, good day, everybody. This is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal and on behalf of the Psalm Foundation and the new Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia by National Geographic Publishing. I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our winery close-up um, educational series. This one is Rising Stars of the Wine World. This is being recorded. It is on Facebook Live. Uh, and you will be able to find links to the recording on psalmjournal.com as well as psalmfoundation.com. The printed recap of this uh, wonderful webinar will be will appear in the April-May issue of the Psalm Journal. And uh, we, in addition to all the great information you're going to hear about, uh, you have some other incentives to help you pay attention. Uh, and here to explain a little bit more about that is Lynn Fletcher from the Psalm Foundation. Welcome, Lynn. Hi, Lars. Thank you. Uh, so we, uh, Psalm Foundation, we'd like to say thank you to you and the Psalm Journal and all of the panelists for making this event possible and these scholarships. Um, so we're going to do a random drawing from all the participants today uh, to select eight people that are going to receive Psalm Geo for one year. And then we're going to have an essay contest. So all of you today are going to receive an email prompt by Monday uh, with an essay question. You'll be given a week to submit your answers. And the top two winners will receive a copy of the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. And first place is going to get a scholarship check for $400. So um, thank you again for the sponsorship of this. And I'll pass it back to Lars. Great. Thank you very much, Lynn. So remember to pay attention. I got to tell you that Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia is amazing. Uh, it's, it's a huge book. I think the, uh, just the, the, the price of mailing it alone is well worth the entry. And of course, 400 bucks for writing an essay. That is a great rate. Uh, it's an even better editorial rate than we have here. Uh, so what we're talking about today with rising stars, you know, the wine world is rich in traditions, history, and iconic figures, but it's true spice, we like to say, is the advent of something or someone new or both, an innovation or an innovator, again, or both. Uh, so what we put together here is a panel of people that in their own way, each bring something new to the table. Um, and speaking of new to the table, we also have a wonderful program uh, called Sam Geo. Uh, which I always, and I, uh, Greg, you've heard this ad nauseum, but I always like to say it's Google Maps meets wine country. Uh, Greg Von Wagner is a longtime Psalm at Jimmy's Mastermind behind this in-depth program. And Greg is going to give us a little bit of an overview of where we're going today and then uh, take us through each of our stops as I, uh, as I present our wonderful panelists. So Greg, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see uh, such a great group of wineries and uh, a cool theme and Looking forward to checking all of them out. And as uh, Lars mentioned, uh, Psalm Geo, so it's part of a larger platform that also has quite a bit of in-depth wine theory for the whole world. Uh, tours similar to this that cover all the world's notable wine regions uh, and over a hundred high resolution paper maps uh, that you can print as well as download. Uh, but today we're going to be going all around the world. Uh, so we're gonna start off in California with uh, um, you know, many of our wineries represented from there. We have As One Crew, Lloyd Cellars, and Oak Ridge. So Napa, Napa, and Lodi. And then we go down to Paso Robles uh, for patrimony, down to the uh, Southern Hemisphere in Chile with Conca y Tora, and then over to Italy uh, for Rosa Regale. Um, so a widespread. But we're going to start off first with 
California. Um, as one crew, we are located here in Napa, um, obviously the, probably the most worldwide known wine region in California. Um, and we're talking Burgundy varieties closer to the coast here, uh, where you get that cooling from the Pacific, but Cab is uh, extraordinarily well positioned in Napa. Um, as one crew, they do a combination between St. Helena as well as Howe Mountain just there in the background. Um, I always love wines that are a combination of valley fruit and mountain fruit. You know, you get the, the plush textural rich style that comes from the valley as well as, uh, as, well as the mountain fruit that gives, you know, the, the deep color, the intensity and uh, the tannic structure. And I'm uh, excited to check out more. So I'll go uh, back to Lars for that. Often, awesome, thank you very much. Uh, Greg and our first speaker is Chris Radomski from uh, As One Crew in Napa. Chris has uh, been a tremendous innovator in wine and spirits, the name behind 100 Acre, Duke Spirits, and now this latest project, phenomenal project of As One Crew. Chris, welcome and good morning. Good morning or good afternoon, regardless, uh, depending on where you are. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Psalm Journal and everyone attached uh, to inviting me, having me. Um, I think I'm a little bit too old to be a rising star but uh, I'll do my best here. Um, Your wines are, that works. <laughs> um, you know, I, I couldn't say any better. Greg, I think, hit the nail on the head with um, the attributes of different areas of Napa Valley, which are obviously iconic, you know, mountain fruit, valley floor fruit. Um, you know, this project for me, you know, I've been in the wine industry for a long, long time and been fortunate to be around some amazing people. One second, I forgot to start my timer. <laughs> Um, and, and for me, it's been a great learning experience about the originality, uh, you know, plus the type of wines I like. We've had a, you know, through my career, I've done a lot of different innovation with uh, length of aging, type of barrels, size of barrels, things like that. And the goal here, when, when I sort of, you know, wanted to introduce this brand and just to tell you about the name as one crew, uh, I have a great group of friends, chefs, psalms, um, former hockey players, I am Canadian. And we had a, a, a chat group on um, on texting, and we, you know, we're cooking, uh, we're eating wine, drinking wine, talking about our friends, family, sports, and things I can't mention. But we developed this group of about six or seven people, all from different backgrounds, some who never really explored wine before, but now are really deep into it. And as I was working on this project, um, you know, to source some amazing fruit in uh, the Napa region to start to develop a brand, I asked them if they wanted to become part of it. Uh, because we're a great collection of friends and we sort of nicknamed ourselves the crew and the whole idea behind the wine is a very uh, open welcoming concept of being as one. So uh, we don't pass judgment uh, unless you're not a nice person, but we've got an eclectic group of people behind this and uh, that's what the brand's really all about is um, encompassing uh, people and bringing people together, especially, you know, now in this time, it's just even more important. Getting quickly to the wines, uh, two various, two completely different regions in Napa Valley and varietals. Um, again, this goes back to some of my history, but our Pinot Noir uh, is a Carneros a Pinot, a vineyard called Stanley Ranch, which goes back to the 40s. And if you've driven up into Napa Valley at the bottom, you'll see that there's low-lying lands, marsh, things like that. And that whole area kind of brings in a lot of cool, cool air, especially in the summertime. And uh, there are a lot of great Pinot vineyards down there. It's really a great spot to grow Pinot, Pinot the, uh, the ground drains well. And, you know, when it gets super hot in the summer, uh, the northern parts of Napa Valley tend to suck the hot out of there, uh, the coolness out of there, I mean. So uh, it's got a really good airflow. And, it, and, and you know, it, it, that's why it's a really nice area to, to, uh, to grow Pinot Noir. Now, the little twist on this Pinot, uh, and it's something we did in the past, is, uh, you know, being a big cab drinker, I love meteor wines. So I wanted to create something that reflected the true nature of Pinot Noir, but had a little bit more oomph to it. So we, we allow the fruit to hang longer. It's higher in alcohol. The first vintage is around 15.3, which is a little high for Pinot. But I think the way we, we mellow that is uh, it gets uh, fermented and aged in second use uh, French oak Cabernet barrels. Uh, we ferment in punchins, then we age in barrels. And this particular first vintage was in barrel for over two years. And uh, it was a bit of an experiment, but also you know during COVID times and all this, it was kind of difficult to maneuver and get things done. So I kind of had no choice to do it, but I, I really love the way the wine developed and, and came across. Um, so our, you know, our first release as a brand was the 2000, sorry, 2018 Pinot Noir from Stanley Rand's Carneros. It's very small production. 
you know, you'll find it on-premise in a couple states, but uh, the goal is to really provide a well-balanced Pinot Noir with a little bit more heart to it. Um, at the same time, I um, had, a, had an opportunity great, to have access to some great vineyards more north and um, had access to some great fruit from my vineyard uh, up in the mountains at Hell Mountain above the fog line and also some Valley Floor vineyards in San Helena. And again, as Greg has said, you know, each of those vineyards in the altitudes has certain attributes um, that I think when you put them together, allow you to produce a wine or, you know, give you the ability to produce a wine that has the, the tannic strength, um, the power, but also the body and the balance of, of what you get from the valley floor. And you're talking, you know, two different climate types, you know, although the vineyards are probably about 15 minutes apart from each other, the altitudes, the climate, the soil types, and even though I'm a huge proponent of single vineyard wines, um, I think that combination works very, very well together. And I think you'll find when you try our Cabernet, it, it really expresses that balance. And I think that, you know, if you make a, a great big wine, it, as long as it's balanced and done right, that it's approachable very early on in its life. And I think a lot of producers around the world, specifically Napa, have shown that recently, that, um, you know, if you, if you do it with care in the right way, now the Cabernet also like the Pinot, uh, it, it, it sits in uh, fresh, you know, first use French oak barrels. Uh, and this is aging barrels quite a long time. So it's been in the barrel for almost two and a half years. And I think you really notice that in the development of the wine. And uh, it's also been bottled for quite some time. And it just recently got a release or 16. Uh, you know, we only produced 200 cases. Um, you know, we sold out to our mailing list and limited distribution to the States uh, for, for restaurants. Um, and you know, getting back to, the brand, we wanted to make something that was understandable, approachable, uh, that was good. And it's, it's been amazing for me to, to work making these wines. Um, you know, we, we fortunately are, are able to make them, uh, make dear friends, a winery, Fela, Aaron Jordan's an amazing man. And, uh, you know, when I'm not there, kicks it and does a lot of different things. But, you know, my friends that are part of the crew, we sit down together. So it's interesting to bring an opinion from, you know, uh, a great chef, uh, Psalms, uh, and people just love wine and drink a lot of wine. I've, I've been fortunate to try a lot of wine and you get a lot of different opinions. And uh, I think ultimately uh, for wine to be successful, uh, I'd love it to be uh, liked by a lot of different people. So if you're into wine, you, you, you know, you've taken the time to learn a little bit. Um, you know, that was the idea of make it approachable. And then why don't you create a brand that explored like we did in the past, great wine regions, uh, we're working on stuff in Italy. Uh, we've, we've, done a, we've done a sparkling in Soma, which is incredible, the Brut. You know, very low volumes, but to really offer a lineup that, you know, highlights great parts of Napa and the world, but also make wines approachable and affordable to everybody. And, uh, you know, we've all had the great wines of the world, and it's great to, to learn from that, um, you know, expensive wines. But I think this is a, a really interesting um, exploration in, in soil and originality. And where am I at there? Did I do it? Excellent. Well said. Uh, no, the wines are really beautiful, Chris. Very well done. The Cabernet has just got tons of layers of flavor, great depth to it, super round. Uh, now, the Pinot Noir, you said Cabernet barrels. If I recall reading correctly, it's Cabernet Franc barrels, correct? Well, there was a misprint on the website that's been ah, corrected. One okay. of my colleagues pointed that out to me, sorry. Okay, never mind then. <laughs> But it's, it, it's, it's got, again, warmer climate, so a little bit fuller bodied, but great freshness to it as well. Really, two very well-made wines. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, everyone. Um, good luck with everyone this year and look forward to having a great year and drinking a lot of wine in restaurants and at home. Amen. We're all looking forward to that. Thanks, Chris. All right, Greg, what's our next stop on the Star Tour and this constellation? We are in Napa, um, right by the San Pablo Bay, specifically Carneros. Um, and so we're gonna be focusing on a different sector. Um, one of the original ABAs when the system was established. And as we all know, Carneros shared with uh, Sonoma County. As well, we lost you, Greg. Greg all right, can you hear me now? Yep, welcome back. Perfect. Um, so yeah, right, right by the base where Pinot Noir and Chardonnay really thrive. Um, Lloyd Sellers in particular, I really, really love their uh, Chardonnay is definitely a strength. 
Um, we are just right here outside of the town of Napa, um, where it really is a specialty of Burgundy varieties. And with that, back to Lars for more. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so next up, we've got Rob Lloyd from Lloyd Cellars in Napa. Rob has worked at many of the big names, Cake Bread, Stag's Leap, La Crema, Rumbauer, uh, and he's had his own label since 2008. Uh, and I know today we're going to be talking about prescription Chardonnay and Cabernet. So, Rob, I just want to chat with you a little bit. Uh, your background cites your father's love for Chardonnay, all those great wineries that you worked with, and of course your education at UC Davis. Uh, interesting that you came. UC Davis was, uh, I won't call it an afterthought, but you got your business uh, degree first, which also explains a lot of your uh, approach to the wine business. Um, but at Lloyd Cellars, you said that you're basically making wines that you prefer. How would you describe the wines that you prefer um, and how that preference was formed by those combination of past influences? Well, I mean, it, you know, one, Lars, nice talking to you again. Happy back with some journal, but um, you know my dad always loved kind of big California shards, and so I think you know what you go up drinking is what you tend to really like. And I mean, you know, we had when we had done something before. Someone asked you know, if you could put music to the style of wine, what would you do? Um, you know, mine is Sir Mix a lot. You know, I like big shards, and I cannot lie. So it, it definitely is a style that I like. It's a style that I drink. Excellent. That's very cool. Um, tell us a little bit about this label, this prescription. Where, uh, the, how, how is it different from your Lloyd Sellers label, and um, what's what's the inspiration behind that name? So uh, prescription, yeah, we, my wife and I wanted to uh, have another label besides Lloyd to allow us to kind of go outside just of the Napa area. And uh, prescription, um, one of the terms for prescription is uh, basically recipe. And it used to drive me crazy because people would be like, oh, do you know the recipe for making big shards? Um, and so it was kind of a play off of that. And then from the label, you can see um, we took it in uh, the label in a different direction and went more with uh, basically the idea that in the 20s during prohibition, you had to have a prescription to drink wine. So that's kind of where the filigree and, and some of the, the details in the label came from. Very cool. I know. I know. In Italian, um, when you ask for a prescription, it's a, a ricetta, a recipe. Yes, yeah. the pharmacist for a recipe, which is always very cool. So, uh, now you 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 just said you like big chardonnays, but I don't know that I would classify this as big. It's certainly got a lot of real nice, beautiful tropical fruit flavors, brightness. Uh, when I think big chardonnay, I'm thinking things that are overly overly buttery, overly oak. This is anything but. Um, tell us a little bit about where this come from. I, I know you have a great um, source with the Reamer family and James Reamer in Clarksburg, uh, which has a lot of very fertile soils. Uh, it's outside of Sacramento, correct? Uh, yep. What is it about those grapes that really hone in on your winemaking style? So, you know, it's really, for me, I love working with growers that kind of get balance. Uh, I've got, you know, a grower of Zinfandel, you know, up in Mendocino that he gets less than one ton per acre of head train, dry farm vines. Uh, the cab that you're going to taste next that's about three to four tons per acre. With this prescription Chardonnay, James is able to balance it about eight tons per acre. The, the water level, water table is about six, seven feet below where that ground is. So he needs to use rootstocks that, you know, basically do not dig. You know, he's not wanting to use old St. George, but that, you know, rather will go out, but he has, you know, plenty of water. So the idea is to try and balance that vine by putting a little bit heavier crop load on it. And the vines are in balance there. Um, he's using a Robert Young clone, which I really like uh, for his area. It just gives those really tropical flavors. And so the, the, it's pretty amazing to me. Before I worked with James over a decade ago, I always thought there would be a little too warm for Chardonnay, but it comes in about one week ahead of my Carnero Chardonnay. Um, you basically get a lot of the cooling influence. There are a lot of water channels through there, and those water channels almost kind of spill over and give you that cold night air. So and with this wine, you know, a, a lot of the grapes I'm picking, I'm picking kind of sugar and flavor with prescription. I'm really looking at when the acids start to change. I'm trying to preserve that really fresh um, acid balance in the wine. Oh, yeah. yeah and you have. It's, it's zingy. Uh, it's zesty. It's got this, you know, talk about water sources. It's got this almost spring-like freshness to it. 
Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, coming from how, you know, how we make this, you know, I make my Lloyd shark and it's all barrel fermented. And, you know, I am trying to pay attention, you know, to how much CO2 is in the wine. But with this, we are tank fermenting. And so we're still going through that extremely slow fermentation process. I mean, I stop one primary, then we go through a really slow secondary. But we're doing it in tank and tanks that are topped up. So I'm able to keep a lot of natural CO2 in the wine. And, you know, for some of the guys out there that, you know, love the term, uh, what is it, uh, pet nat. You know, with the natural high, you know, CO2 level, I'm bottling this at about 1800 milligrams to 1900. So really keeping a lot of that natural, which is difficult to do. And it's funny, I've had people ask if the wine was re-fermenting. It's like, no, there's no sugar. It's not re-fermenting. It's just, and it's a lot of work to keep that high natural CO2. But that's why you're getting that almost kind of burst of freshness when you yeah. first pour that glass. And it's fun because as you continue, like if you're myself drinking the entire bottle, but as you continue to drink, the CO2 comes out and that's where you really tend to get more of that richness to show up. So it's just almost like a little journey as you're drinking. Yeah, CO2 definitely lifts it. It reminds me a lot more of the European style of winemaking from certain yeah. areas in, uh, in France and Italy and even Germany with the, not only the good acidity, but that little bit of CO2 that lifts it up. Yep. That's cool. The wind kicks up a little bit, so we have to watch your microphone. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're outside, though. Where are you standing right now? <laughs> I'm actually in uh, Coombsville, uh, oh, just nice. outside of the vineyard. So let's talk about the Cabernet for a second. I mean, I, I know you make a lot of different wines, but you're, you're especially known for, for when it comes to red for your prowess in Pinot Noir. Uh, but here with the Cabernet, you've chosen again to work in a cooler climate, um, Mediterranean climate in the Alexander Valley. Uh, why that decision and what about the Cabernet really do you think really fits your style? Uh, yeah, the, the vineyard, we, the 2018 was the first uh, Cabernet that we released under prescription from there. I've been working with that vineyard uh, since about 2010. So I've been working with it for a long time, making it for some other projects. Um, but I love this vineyard. It's up at about 1700 feet elevation. Uh, it looks like, you know, it's on the extreme hillside. Um, it almost looks like you're at the top of a volcano. Um, so the, the yields are very small. The berries are ridiculously tiny. And so really concentrated. I actually you know, was able to start working with the vineyard because another winery uh, had a hard time taming the tannins. But if you're drinking it, you see we've been able to kind of tame those. Lots of oxygen, um, trying to really smooth out those tannins during the ferment. Yeah, I mean, don't don't take this the wrong way because I'm not by any stretch of the imagination trying to say that your wines are standardized. But tasting both of these wines back to back, I can definitely see that the fil rouge, as they say in French, the the your signature is definitely there. That style, that brightness, that fresh fruit, uh, zingy acidity, but both really delicious wines. So compliments oh, I, on that. I, I, you're tasting what I love doing. It's fun getting to make this stuff, and even a little bit more fun getting to drink it. We love that. Awesome. Rob, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Lars. To Coombsville. All righty. So, Greg, what's our next stop in this constellation of rising stars? All right. So we're headed over to Lodi with Oak Ridge Winery. Uh, Lodi, it's situated perfectly in line uh, with the San Francisco River Delta. And this brings in cooling breezes from the Pacific in a way that areas to the south and to the north uh, don't really receive. Um, in addition, you know, one thing that uh, Lodi really benefits from is some of the, is, is literally the largest cache of old vines in the United States. Now, a lot of this has to do with the shipping varieties during Prohibition, sending uh, bricks of grape must out on the railway system. Here we have, this is uh, Mocha Lumne River AVA. This is uh, really a place that has many of the core vineyards, uh, has direct access to the San Francisco River Delta and many of, uh, many of the top wineries as well. And so you could consider this like a ground zero for the Lodi wine industry. And with that, uh, Lars, back to you. Awesome, thank you, Greg. Um, you know, this is great. Well, we don't really, I haven't heard a lot about Lodi, so this is a, a fun experience. So we have with us Laura Chadwell, who is chief winemaker for Oak Ridge Winery. Laura grew up in Lodi, uh, part of the product of the terroir there, also went to UC Davis. She was an intern and winemaker at Woodbridge and since 2020, she's been chief winemaker at Majo Estate. So Laura, welcome. Tell us a little bit about Lodi and what you guys are doing. Tell us your, your backstory there. 
Uh, you're on mute, Laura. There it is. Sorry, I couldn't find the button after I started presenting. And I... <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, um, so I actually, I started working for Oak Ridge just uh, in 2021, very recently. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on the winery before we talk about our Maggio states, which we're very excited about the launch. So as you had up on the screen before, um, this uh, Oak Ridge is the oldest operating winery in Lodi. Um, Angelo Maggio came to Lodi in 1906 from Italy and um, started his, his business in the wine industry, um, planted his first cuttings in 1928. And as you mentioned, um, kind of grew that through prohibition shipping out to uh, Riviera Fruit Company um, while Lodi was kind of growing. So fast forward to today, um, his great great granddaughters and their families run uh, the business, run the winery, and they own 2,500 acres of grapes within the Lodi AVA, uh, which is really exciting for us. All of our fruit we bring in is family owned, operated, and it's really exciting. Um, all of our vineyards follow the Lodi Rules Certified Green program. Um, which is just a, a, a commitment to sustainable sustainability, wine growing, everything like that. Um, very exciting. So a um, little bit more about the Lodi AVA, um, seven sub AVAs, which is really cool. And the big difference between all, all of these different locations is the soil. Um, as you mentioned, the McCollamy River plays a huge role in the topography here. We have uh, the McCollamy River AVA is the largest of the seven. I think it has... Um, I can't recall the number of uh, acres we have, um, but it's the largest and that's where a majority of our vineyards sit. We do have a few up in the, to the north in the Jayhant region. It's actually separated just by a road. Um, and so the Chardonnay that we're talking about today gets about 60% of its grips from that McCollamy River and then the remainder from the Jayhant. Um, McCollamy River being obviously mostly a riverbed, super sandy soils, uh, very good drainage, really beautiful for Chardonnay. And then up to the north in the Jayhan, it's a little bit more clay. You've got that hard pan, shallower soils, um, but it is a touch cooler than McCollamy. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Again, Lode is beautiful, you know, on its face, it's beautiful with the river running through. Um, but that really does give us a lot of good options um, in terms of grape growing. Like I mentioned, the soil is, is very rich. It's very deep in most parts, but it does have um, a lot of good nutrition, really deep waterbed, especially recently during all of the droughts we've been seeing. Um, but it's very interesting and there's lots of, of different sort of sub climates happening here. Um, so we do get some really interesting fruit. So a little bit about the vineyards in this particular wine, this Maggio estate, like I mentioned, um, the Delta, k and Delta is our Jayhant AVA portion. Um, along with the McCallamy, like I said, it's rated the, the coolest of the seven. This one's just a little bit cooler because we do have a little bit more Delta fog influence during the summer, which is beautiful for Chardonnay. It prevents it from burning. Um, in that kind of early morning, really intense sun and slow ripening. So the Jayhant portion ripened about a week after um, our McCallamy. And like I mentioned with the McCallamy in the Destino Vineyard, beautiful drainage. Um, it causes just that right amount of, you know, sort of stress on the vines. Uh, we don't have to worry about um, watering in a lot of these vineyards. They're dry farms kind of by nature because like I mentioned, it's very dry here. Um, but these vines are on the older side. I believe the Chardonnay runs about 20 years old on average. Um, we do have a few head trained as well. Uh, super low vigor, which uh, is really balanced out by the crop size and we get high fruit intensity in both AVAs, um, really good acidity too. And it's about kind of hitting that balance um, in harvest. And so we have our harvest sort of parameters with bricks and, and TA, but we're really just out there tasting and, and calling the pick on these blocks when the grapes feel right, um, which is beautiful for the wine. So jumping into our, uh, we're here for the Maggio Estate. So this is a, a super premium launch first for our winery, which is really exciting. We do have a Chardonnay in the cab. Um, we shared the Chardonnay with you because it bottled, both of these bottled about three days ago. Um, so we were confident that the cab wouldn't be showing very well, but the Chardonnay is, is, is doing a little better, but it's still, you know, in that kind of shock period. So what we really did here is, like I mentioned, we were really particular about the harvest and we didn't go into it having a protocol or an idea of really what this wine was supposed to be. We wanted the grapes to speak for themselves and really show the appellation as much as possible. So we did some in steel, some in French, some in American oak, and really just waited to see what the wines became. Everything went through malolactic. 
Um, but we chose the best of the best in these lots to go into this wine. Um, and so what we ended up with was something that was very delicate in the nose once it comes out of its bottle shock. Um, it has some really beautiful floral, sort of orange blossom, a little bit of that spicy French oak. Um, in the mouth, it is a higher alcohol, it's about 14.9. Um, and so you have a ton of body, but it's balanced out with a really beautiful acidity. You get the concentrated fruit flavors. It's not overwhelmingly oaky. You get a little bit of that kind of Meyer lemon. I think salted shortbread is a really great descriptor because it's a little savory, but it's also kind of toasty because of, of the oak that we use. Um, medium, I'd say medium plus palate weight, very smooth and a, and a really nice lingering aftertaste. Um, as far as Chardonnay goes, we wanted to lean, we did want to lean away from the big buttery California typical sort of style and go with something a little bit more delicate um, and really add some finesse to our portfolio. And I think the cab goes right along with that. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, so that's all. I think I did it in under my seven minutes, hopefully. <laughs> you did, you did, you did <laughs> Great. brilliantly. Thank you. Uh, no, the wine is very nice. I definitely get some of that, um, that Meyer lemon cream and um, the shortbread as well. There's a, there's an earthiness to the wine. I don't know if that's part of the, the bottle shock or not, but uh, it is very round. Um, got a lot of depth to it. A lot of layers. Yes, it does. We're very happy with it. And I can't wait to taste it in uh, a few weeks and see, <laughs> see, see it come back to life a little bit, but it is, it's showing relatively well at this point. Great. All right. Excellent, Laura. Thank you very much. We're going to ask you to take your share screen down. And then Greg is going to keep us moving. I think we've got one more stop in California, correct, Greg? That is correct, Lars. So we are going down to uh, Paso Robles. Uh, very interesting place. Cool northwest winds from the Pacific hit the uh, Santa Lucia range just right in here um, and wring out most of their moisture. So you end up with a um, a rain shadow over Paso itself. Uh, the Templeton Gap, not necessarily just one spot, um, but an overarching group of lower lying hills allows some of that impact in. And the net result is that Western Paso is significantly cooler, uh, rainier, and um, also not, not because of the mountains, but it's also much hillier than regions to the east. Uh, Paso is also interesting because you get these uh, large diurnal temperature shifts between day and night and limestone soils that uh, are unique. You know, in the United States, there's there's not really a lot of regions, hardly any that I can think of, that actually have limestone soils. And here we have Patrimony right at the top of Dow Mountain, uh, ideally situated close to the Pacific and a really beautiful vineyard there great site and I'm excited to check out more. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. So with us, we have Daniel Dow, who I think in these circles needs no introduction. He is the Prince of Phenolics. Uh, Daniel has a well-earned reputation for innovation and groundbreaking, a uh, very firm believer in Paso's proclivity for Cabernet Sauvignon. And Daniel, would you say it's fair to say that you've created a little bit of a grand crew here with Patrimony? I think so. I mean, we like to refer to it as a California first growth, but uh, definitely causing uh, not only disruption in the wine industry, but I think it's causing the world to stop and really think twice about what grows in Paso. Excellent. Well, tell us, tell us more. Great. Well, patrimony. Uh, run you first quickly through the, through the estate itself. Okay, on my clock to make sure I'm good. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. you know, patrimony is meant to do two things. One is to really showcase the potential that phenolics can reach with Bordeaux varieties. Uh, across the globe, uh, measuring 700 Bordeaux wines from all over the world. Uh, arguably, uh, patrimony is up there, one of the darkest, if not the darkest and the highest phenolic uh, wine in terms of measurements. But it seeks to do another thing, which is a very unique thing that I want to stress today, is it seeks at representing the purest expression of our terroir in the glass. And I'll explain to you in a couple of slides how we're doing that. Uh, but a phenolic phenomenon, clearly, achieving uber high phenolics for Bordeaux varieties. It's a 630 acre estate, by the way, in the Adelaide district of Paso Robles, with 266 acres either already on their vine or being planted. But by next year, there'll be 266 acres on their vine. Elevations ranging from 1500 to 2200 feet. Incidentally, this is the only vineyard we know of that's at 2200 feet elevation that grows Bordeaux varieties that is only at 14 miles from the very cold Pacific Ocean in California. 
uh, steep slopes everywhere ranging up to 65%. 100% of the soil is argilo calcaire or calcareous clay. And I often like to correct what people say, it is not limestone per se as much as calcareous clay. The clay is important for Bordeaux varieties. Uh, it's dry farmed, which is actually allowing us to do this through these soils or deficit irrigating depending on the year. Vine density very high, 6,700 to 9,000 vines per hectare. And uh, the winery itself is actually expected to break ground in 2023. For now, we're sharing the Dow winery to make the wines and to actually promote the wines in the tasting room. Um, the tasting room and the winery will include hospitality, will be net zero emission, LEED certified, and we hope to complete it by 2024. Let's talk about terroir. Uh, obviously, terroir can be many things, so we're not going to go too crazy over terroir, but let's talk about soils and climate. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, most of European soil, most of European vineyards, be it uh, the Moser region, Bordeaux, Bourgogne, Champagne, Alsace, Tuscany, with the Galestro soils, you find these calcareous clay soils. Uh, if you walk on top of the soil, you think it's clay, but underneath there's this very brittle and porous limestone. So the clay and the calcareous both play parts. The clay provides you color, which is texture, and texture is a very important thing, especially with Bordeaux wines. Uh, bouquet, nose, fat and flesh in the wine, but the calcareous is going to provide you minerality and natural acidity. I want to stress that. Non-acidulated wines, those soils allow you to make wines and reach physiological ripeness by never having to add acid. As a matter of fact, we have sometimes the opposite problem, the acids are too high. And then last but not least, dry farming potential. This is another picture of our soil. You see how you have the clay, you have the limestone underneath, and you have the roots trying to push through, and that draws minerality and beautiful earthiness into the wine themselves. Paso is awfully misunderstood for climate. I can have yet to go through one week without hearing somebody say Paso's hot. That would be the equivalent of somebody going to Carneros and leaving and writing an article that Napa and Sonoma is too cold for cab, which would make no sense. So let's talk about Paso. We are right between Bordeaux and Santa Elena. I would say we're probably from a climate standpoint equivalent to Oakville in most years. So for instance, in 2019, not a single day at 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. Paso saw 27 days on the east side, 11 in, in Santa Elena, four in Poyac. Our temperature is three degrees cooler in Santa Elena and five degrees cooler than Paso. Same with 2020, same with 2021. 2021 being a much cooler vintage with an average temperature of 83 degrees. Right after August, things cool down, never warm back up. So our temperature is really actually perfect because it allows us to achieve ripeness year after year without having to generate these uber high you know, uh, uh, alcohols as well as the jammy characters that sometimes California wines are known for. Let's look, this is a picture of harvest time. You notice how we are the highest elevation in Paso. So the fog comes in, rolls at the bottom of the hill. And uh, this is a block that had just been harvested. I tend to show up at the winery at 5, 5.30 every morning during harvest. So I took this picture, but it really illustrates well how unique the terroir is. This is another picture of where the patrimony site is, where the tasting room will be going. You see hundreds of miles away, beautiful landscapes that are actually reminiscent of Tuscany because I actually have a vineyard in Tuscany as well that I'm planting. This looks like Tuscany to me, but it's beautiful regardless of where it is. What does it mean in the glass, these uber high phenomics? And what does it mean the special terroir? It means that we retain our freshness, very important. We retain our freshness, the balance as well, and the elegance. Wines pair extremely well with food because the acidity is not added, but it is actually very much integrated. So it doesn't bite, it doesn't scratch, it flows very easily. The best part that I like about these wines is that we're able to achieve, never seen before power, but without sacrificing elegance in class. Um, the patrimony process very quickly. Um, one, all the wines are 100% free run. That allows us to have very silky and integrated tannins uh, that come from skin. 100% fermented with our native yeast, which is our D20 yeast that we isolated uh, back about 10 years ago. And now is actually available all over the world. It's a yeast that operates and behaves like a buy in a strain, but it is a Saccharomyces service, which really gives you all the benefits of that yeast. There's no acidification, there's no adulteration, there's nothing used to make the wine besides native yeast and nutrients for the yeast to finish the fermentations. As a result of that, most patrimony wines are under 0.5 gram per liter of residual sugar in bottle. All the grapes are sorted with an optical sorter, a blank. Uh, phenolic measurements occur two to three times a day, so we can balance out the tannins. The color comes out quickly and the tannins can be so high 
that this is going to shock many of you here. Our skin contact is two to seven days after cold soaking is done. And very quickly, those phenolics go out, out of control, and we manage them by basically draining off skins. The elevage is 27 to 30 months, which gives us longer, smoother, longer chain tannins, smoother tannins, which are very much make the wine approachable upon release. And we age the wine at 50 to 52 degrees because we don't like to add more than about 10 to 12 parts of SO2 during the lavage. The temperature allows us to control bacteria if there's any by basically cooling the wines you know, cooler. All the corks are also guaranteed ECA free. The barrel, we wanted to have the purest expression of terroir. So not only do we use our native yeast, obviously our grapes, but we also developed a barrel that we make and season on our mountain for three years with a custom toast. Extra tight grain comes from a very strain of oak in French called Bois Rosé, which comes usually from old trees that are very, very unique flavors. We started this program about 10, 10 years ago. We aged that barrel in France where we use it with some of our wines for five years, but in our mountain, we season it for only three years and the results are fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Daniel. Well done, well stated. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, the acidity definitely plays a supporting role, pun intended. But uh, I think this wine has beautiful minerality to it. Really nice. Thank you. I, I get a lot of crushed stones and violets yeah. when, you, when I drink this wine. Most definitely. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so, Greg, we got another stop or two to make? Yes. Yeah, so we are headed down to the Southern Hemisphere, South America, um, to Chile. And, you know, two of the big um, components of the climate in Chile uh, the Andes Mountains, of course, uh, these are a continent-defining characteristic of South America. They run 4,000 feet north to south uh, and have peaks over 20,000 feet. So this creates a rain shadow effect for Western Argentina, um, but also cool downdrafts coming from the mountains help to cool the eastern side of some of these wine regions. And the Humboldt Current, this is a cold northerly climate or uh, current that uh, helps to cool uh, the western side of all of these wine regions, and in many areas making uh, quite cool growing regions that uh, specialize in Burgundy varieties and Sauvignon Blanc. But uh, today we're talking Cab, uh, some of the top regions, the Maipo, Cachapol, and Male Valley. Uh, the wine in specific we're talking about today has a, has a focus on the Male Valley, um, definitely adds a great balance to that wine. But one of the classic components in a, in a cab blend um, comes from the Maipo, just on the outskirts of Santiago here in Pirque, uh, one of the top areas. Um, and really excited to hear more. So back to Lars for that. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so we have Isabel Mitarakis, who is a winemaker at Conchitura in Chile. Isabel is a descendant of a very storied family, uh, multiple generations of creation and innovation in Chile. Um, I, I, is about, I'm going to sound very old when it's I know your grandfather. Um, but, <laughs> uh, really have always admired the 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 Gili Sasti family and the Mitarakis branch for what you guys have accomplished there. And now you are obviously picking up the torch and making new innovation on your own. So tell us about this exciting new project that you've got going on, Isabel, please. Yeah, thank you, Lars. So this is a new project that we create in Cochitoro. It's a I'm gonna present you. So it's, it's a new brand called Unrated. And Unrated, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon that we call, it's born in Chile. So it's a, it's a blend of a Cabernet Sauvignon that different area and different parcels of, of Chile. So why we want to try to, to do with this cup? to create a new category because we want to provoke the wine industry with a wine very disruptive uh, to, to show uh, for the US market and also for Chile, um, a, a brand that is, has a packaging very provocative. So we are talking about the people who has the attitude to, uh, to drink the underrated, everyone everyone, the people, we are looking for people that don't want to have some rules for a specific rules, like the wine snob rules in wine. So you can drink this wine with what you want, with who you want. Here, you don't have rules. So 
Conchitoro give me the freedom to create a Cabernet Sauvignon that come from, from different area of Chile. So because of that, we said that is born in Chile. For explain a little bit about me, I started working in Conchitoro in 2013 in Don Melchor. So I started working in the iconic Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile. So when the winery said that now you have the freedom to create a Cabernet Sauvignon, that you have the freedom to create a cab to express the typicity, the expression of Chile of a cab. So for me, it was amazing because now I don't have rules. I don't have limit. My only limit is Chile. So it was wonderful. So I create this wine that come from Maipo, Cauquenes, and Requinoa. So for explain a little bit more about this wine, I want to say that Extra Cup, I, I always compare this wine with the music. For example, I said this cup is like a Lady Gaga because nobody have doubt about her voice. She has an, an, ex, she has an extraordinary voice, a very, a full voice, full body voice. So nobody have doubt about the super, the super premium voice that she has. In this case, it's the same. Nobody have doubt about this cab. It's a super premium Cabernet Sauvignon that born in Chile, and but different attitude. The packaging, the concept behind is completely different. So it's more disruptive. So it's provocative. So it's like Lady Gaga, a super cab with different attitude. So this is the X, the unrated, and we try to create a category that called extra cab because it's come from extraordinary parcel of different parts of Chile. So every year I can change the blend of the parcels. Now I have a, a blend that come from Maipo, Cauquenes, and Requinoa, but maybe in the next year I'm gonna put Peumo, and the other year I'm gonna put a cab in it, but always it's gonna be a cab, an extra cab. So to show more a little bit that the, the terrar, what the difference of this cabernet give for the final blend? Cauquenes is a is a is have the energy, the power in terms of the blend, have the, the potential, the clay in the soil that have clay. So you have like more rustic tannins in these kinds of wine. Puente Alto give the, all the elegance, the finesse. So if you drink a Cabernet Sauvignon that comes from Maipo, you have the elegance, the finesse in mouth, very soft, sweet. And Requinoa, Cachapoal Valley, in this case, is a bridge. It's a bridge that mix Cauquenes with Maipo. Because Maipo have, have the influence from the Andes, Cauquenes have the influence from the Pacific Ocean, and Requinoa is in between of both places. So this is a blend that, that you can see the different expression that we can find in Chile, like with the influence of the coast, the influence from the Andes, and also in between the two ranges. So that is why unrated show and borns in Chile. And the 2018 vintage, uh, when we talk about the wine, we don't want to say, okay, oh, which is the best pairing food, everything. With how many aging potential forever? Why? <laughs> so it's, we want to provoke this kind of thing with this wine. So here you can see unrated and the label. And this, I love this label because you don't have one, one is the front, the two sides, you can use it like the front or the back. No rules here. So. I love this. it. <laughs> I love it. Um, the wine is, you know, this is uh, when uh, we were first working together with the, with the Gili Sasti family years ago and talking about um, almost a new category of wines when Chile was coming of age sort of um, we talked about super Chileans. Um, what that means, I don't really know, but <laughs> I, I think I can describe this as the new super Chilean. It is just a bold expression. Um, 
I, I can taste chili in it, but at the same time, you could tell me that it comes from any of the great winemaking regions of the world. And I love the, the just no holds barred approach to it. So congratulations, Isabel, well done. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Greg, let's uh, go on our next star searcher trek. Absolutely. Um, for our next wine, Rosa Vergale, we are headed over to the Piedmont. Um, so Northwestern Italy, right at the base of the Alps, um, really few, if any, wine regions in all of Italy have as many uh, of the classic great wine regions as Piedmont. Also very well known for food. Um, often when we're talking Piemontese wines, you know, a lot of the focus goes to Barolo and Barbaresco. But beyond those Nebbiolo-based wines, you have, of course, uh, a range of indigenous grapes to the region. Uh, Barbera, Dolcetto, Arneas, uh, and of course, um, Brichetto. So Brichetto da Acqui, done using the Charmat method uh, to keep these wines uh, with this really fresh fruit character, raspberry and cherry. Um, and it's a red effervescent style that's like a secret weapon for difficult and classic pairings alike. Um, you know, I come to think of like prosciutto and different cheeses, uh, also desserts, and of course drinking it by itself. Um, always a fun thing to have in your arsenal and, uh, and a delicious wine to drink. And with that, back to Lars for more. Amen to that, Greg. I would, uh, I would add mortadella. I would add any breakfast food <laughs> or just breakfast itself. So thank you for that, Greg. And uh, I'm thrilled to introduce another great friend in wine, Dino Altomare. Um, Dino is education director for, for Banfi, a house that is probably best known for its Brunello, but uh, years ago revived and renewed an uh, ancient variety called Brachetto d'Aqui. Uh, and this is a little bit of a preview of the cover story for the March-April issue of Tasting Panel magazine. So Dino, tell us more about what's going on with Rosa Regale. Lars, thank you. Grazie. Thank you for having us. It's wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, we are up in Piemonte, and I'm, I'm grateful today to represent the Mariani family, um, who many of you may know, of course, being considered the builders of Brunello. Um, and they've really been known for exploring and building up wine regions around the world, especially in Italy. Um, and of course, a dedication to sustainability as we do that. And so one great example uh, would be up north in Italy, in Piemonte. Uh, and in particular, in this smaller region within Piemonte, um, in, in Aquiterme, uh, which is part of Brachetto, Brachetto d'Aqui, which is a DOCG uh, zone within Piemonte. And it really is uh, a magical territory, truly, with uh, big variations of climate, of soil, although for the most part we see a lot of clay, rock, a lot of tufaceous soil, um, and also differences in exposure depending on, on where we are, which makes each of these wines so unique. Um, and as is typical with the foothills uh, of the Alps, um, the region's climate is, it can be very harsh in winter, it can be very hot in summer, um, and there's considerable difference uh, from day to night temperature, which of course is so, so important when we talk about the development uh, of, our, of our, our fruit, of our grapes. Um, of course, not only to get the sugar content where we need it, but to retain those beautiful, you know, aromatic compounds that, that we find, particularly in Brachetto. Um, so the Mariani family, we were already in uh, Montalcino, of course, uh, bringing Brunello to the world stage back in the late 1970s. And um, they decided to uh, take on and become a proprietor of a historic uh, 18th century winery in Strevi in Piemonte, which was then called Bruzzone. And of course, one of the main grapes being grown at the time, although not really seen outside of the region, certainly not outside of Italy, was Brachetto. Um, and so in 1981, we did release our first Rosa Regale Brachetto um, from our single La Rosa Vineyard, which you see here. And of course, the world quickly fell in love with that. Um, but it was our style that kind of brought this wine, brought this grape to a whole new level. And we we're very fortunate uh, to have seen Brachetto be embraced by the wine drinking world. Um, and we certainly attribute that to its natural, soft, very versatile profile. And also in recent days, of course, to category growth, when we look at bubbles kind of outside of the traditionally well-known uh, bubble making regions of the world, um, it's certainly a category that has been, has been growing quite, quite a bit in recent years. 
but for us, it's really about how we harness this grape. Um, but Aketo does have the ability to become very sweet very quickly when those grapes start to develop. Uh, but for us, the important thing is really harnessing that natural acidity and that tannic structure. Um, and I know tannins and sparkling wine sounds like a crazy thing, but when you look at Braquetzo, you truly get it. And, and for me, it's almost got this, not only this beautiful strawberry character, but I always like to say strawberry seed. You get this kind of little bite to it, which really helps to round it out. Lars, I know you know what I'm talking about. You've had this many times together. We've had this many times. Um, so in, in a way, um, we, what we had done with Brunello and Montalcino to a smaller scale, uh, we felt that we have done with Braquetto, kind of taking leadership um, and ownership of this particular grape bridal and bringing that to a world stage. And it's very emblematic, I would say, uh, of Bamfi as a company, especially right now. Um, this brand, Rosa de Gale, has become, you know, quickly a rising star because of the newfound focus that we're putting on our estate portfolio. But again, the key is really in how this wine is made. It's a very well-made sweet wine. Uh, and we realized that, you know, as we were looking at our brand, that this is a very fun wine, as Isabel notes. This is kind of a wine that can have no rules. You can do whatever you like with it. It's an incredibly versatile wine. Uh, and as we look forward you know, to the future, we realize there are so many channels of our business uh, that have received this wine so incredibly well. There's been such positive demand, but as a specialty item. And we said, you know, this kind of deserves, this brand of Rosa de Gala deserves to have really a range of wines with a sense of plate. And we want it to all be from Piemonte. So I'm very excited to say that our current um, proprietor, third generation proprietor, Christina Mariani May, uh, has taken on the task to reinvigorate kind of this region and this brand. And in the spring of 2021, on the 20th anniversary actually of launching our first Rosa de Gale, um, we have launched our sparkling white wine, uh, which is from the DOCG Asti zone. Um, it's 100% Moscato Bianco. And I'm very happy to tease out that we also have a rosé coming out uh, in the hopefully near future, which will be all Braquetto um, as well, but in a rosé style as compared to this red sparkling. Um, so of course, we're incredibly grateful to have driven this relatively unknown category of Braquetto. And we're, we're so excited for these new additions from our winery to really light up the region in, in new and unexpected ways, uh, the way that we did with Braquetto. You know, we found, especially with this, our sparkling white, um, I think people are pretty well versed in Moscato, uh, but in Moscato as being a sweet wine. And so again, for us, it was harnessing the grape and our winemaking style, keeping these wines very bright, very fresh, um, and taking this to a fully sparkling wine uh, as well. Same for the, the rosé that's that's coming out next. So it's really a matter of, you know, finding these varietals in these regions that are maybe not known and making these wines in ways that perhaps have not been made in the past um, to be a really versatile uh, flavor profile. And, and we're very grateful to have seen such strong, uh, strong response to that. Awesome. Fantastic. You know, Dino, you, uh, you dropped the S word a couple of times there, meaning sweet. <laughs> but oh uh, I would say that one of the, the secrets to these wines and their balance is the acidity. So these are wines that, yeah, have definitely have a, a, a higher residual sugar content, but um, they definitely become food wines because of that nice acidity. I would not categorize them as dessert wines by any stretch of the imagination. Well, they do pretty well with a good dessert, good, uh, especially good a more chocolate. savory dessert. Um, but definitely things that can... Um, definitely go through many even uh, savory pairings as well because of the acidity and the balance. Yeah and Lars it's been a really interesting thing for us kind of in these last few years obviously with it being such a difficult two years particularly in the on, on trade um, we have found this wine not only to be uh, really accepted well as kind of savory and uh, sweet pairings um, but also in the world of mixology we found this is a great kind of uh, upgrade substitute for a lot of the things you would normally have at at your bar station, anything from lemon juice to liqueurs, even, even a simple syrup or a float, because you have that beautiful acidity, but you also get that nice structure and, and tannic structure. So it can hold up very well uh, in cocktails as well, which has been a great, uh, fun exploration for us. So we're grateful for that. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dino. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Lars. Uh, and thank you, Dino. And thank you, each of our brilliant panelists to these uh, shining stars and the shining star wines. And I think all of you are definitely, I don't know about uh, rising stars, but you're definitely rock stars in my book. Uh, this has been a wonderful educational opportunity. Folks, remember to get your essays in. Uh, Lynn, you want to give us a little bit of reminder of uh, what's at stake and what the deadlines are? 
Hi, Lars. Uh, yep. So we're going to be sending out your essay prompt um, by Monday, maybe earlier. Uh, make sure to check your spam folder if you don't receive the email from us. Um, and you'll have one week until Sunday night at midnight to submit the essays. Uh, and we'll try and get the winners selected by March 9th. Uh, again, first place, uh, we'll get a check for $400. Both first and second place get the new Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. And uh, don't forget, we'll be doing the drawing for SOMGEO too. So eight of you will be getting an email from me saying that you've gotten that. So keep an eye out for that. And that's it. Thanks, awesome. Lars. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, SOM Foundation. Thank you, SOMGEO and Greg. Uh, great uh, traveling with you. Thank you for doing the driving there. Um, uh, so remember that this is going, this has been recorded on Facebook live. It'll also be, the recording will be available on some journal and some foundation.com and the printed recap will be in the April, May issue of the some journal. Thank you guys for tuning in. Join us on March 24th when we have, uh, our webinar on, on interpreting soil and minerality with our guest moderator, Andrea Immer. Uh, and Andrea Robinson. See, I'm dating myself again. I've known Andrea too long. Andrea Robinson. Sorry, John. Um, can't wait to have you here with the panel of winemakers to discuss how minerality and soil come across in their wines. So thank you all very much and uh, have a great rest of the day. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.